there he is. Former Ohio State quarterback Steve Belisari is with us here on the program. Steve, thank you so much, first off, for coming on the OHIO podcast. We truly appreciate this, my friend. I'm glad to be here, man. Thanks for having me. All right. So, Steve, first off, let's let's do this. Um, I always like to start with this question because I love to get everybody's kind of background of where they come from and how they ended up at Ohio State. So what's your recruiting story, my man? How did you how did you end up being a, becoming a Buckeye? Yeah, it's a, it's a long story, actually, because, you know, my dad is from Columbus. My mom's from Cleveland. Um, so got some pretty deep Ohio roots. Actually, my dad played for Woody Hayes back in 58 and 59. Um, I ended up moving to Florida and then, you know, obviously my brother got recruited and went to Ohio state and, um, you know, I had the chance being the younger brother of someone playing D one to get a lot of different recruits, right. I had a lot of different coaches come in when he was getting recruited and, you know, obviously he said, Holy, hopefully if you do well, you know, we'll be back. And that was the case. Um, so, you know, got recruited by a lot of different schools we coming out of South Florida, but, uh, you know, always knew about Ohio state, right. Grew up watching it because of my dad and my family. Um, still have a brother, or sorry, still have two sisters that live, live in Columbus as well. So, um, you know, Coach Cooper offered me as a junior, and, um, you know, I had the opportunity to really narrow it down to Ohio State and Florida State. And uh, I went where I had a chance to play the most, and obviously that was Ohio State. And that's kind, of, kind of my story in a nutshell, really quickly. That's great, man. So, so let, let me, <laughs> so you come to Ohio State, I mean, you got the family ties, right? I mean, that's got to be huge. And that's one thing that I think a lot of people around the country maybe don't understand about Ohio State is that, I mean, we're born into this thing. Like, sure. <laughs> this is, it's, it's, it's really, in a lot of ways, I, I think Chris's daughter said it best. She goes, you guys are a cult, man. I was like, yeah, yeah. we really are. <laughs> this is, I, I think that's fair. <laughs> you might as well own it, right? So, yeah. I mean, gosh, I can't imagine being a boy growing up hearing those stories about Woody Hayes. Do you get, do you have anything good to, to share with the listeners on that? I mean, you know, obviously my dad, you know, he coached high school football and girls softball. And I would say he emulated Woody Hayes quite a bit. Um, if anything, he was harder on, you know, my brother and I than anyone else. You know, and I think there was a couple different times, especially in baseball, of, you know, me throwing a curveball or doing some kind of bonehead play and my dad coming out and, you know, thumping me in the chest saying, hey, man, you know, get it together. Um, but, you know, he, he was a school of hard knocks, right? He learned a lot from Woody, but, you know, he was a unbelievable coach and, you know, had a lot of people come back and really respect him. The softball field down in Florida is named after him. Um, so he was just a hard-nosed guy that didn't really take any BS, and I think it kind of paid off. If you've noticed, you know, my brother Greg played, you know, obviously at Ohio State myself and then my younger sister, Play softball in college. Now she's a softball coach at the University of Delaware. So all of us were pretty athletic in our own right, and uh, a lot of that had to do with my dad. That's that's cool, man. Yeah, you know, speaking of of different coaching, and this is just let's just throw this question out there to you. How do you think coaching has had to change? I mean, gosh, you look at someone like Woody Hayes, and we laugh and joke and be like, "There's no way he could coach today." And I think that's a true statement. But I mean, gosh, look at how much his players love him. I mean, you said it, they emulate them. I can guarantee you that there's a lot of little league coaches and Colt football coaches who, uh, who tried to be Woody Hayes, if you know what I mean, when we were kids growing up, but in general, you know, how has coaching had to change in your mind? I mean, it's changed tremendously, right? I don't know if some of the, the tactics that my dad potentially used on me, uh, would fly today. Right. I mean, you look at social media, and the amount of just eyes that are on everything, you always have to be on, right? And they've always had to be on, but I think it's just a different level of scrutiny now. Um, and you gotta be you know, aware of that. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge is just know who's watching you at any given time. And I think if you look at you know, the psychology of sports, things have changed, right? And I do think there's some old school things that I hope we never get rid of because I think they matter and those values will continue to live on. But uh, those coaches have definitely had a change. I mean, look at across all the sports, right? They're all a little bit different now. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we have a question from listener Larry Daniels here for you. A uh, pretty good question. He says, welcome to the show, Steve. How difficult it was it to balance academics and QB film study and game prep when you were in college? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, that's the key to it, right? You have to learn to 
balance all of those, make sure you're doing well in school. And that's got to be the priority first. Um, my dad always harped on that, right? You know, being a coach, he, he let me know very clearly that football wasn't going to last forever. Um, so you had to take care of school and make sure that you were doing that. And it's really, it's a full-time job. Um, and if you look at the facilities now, um, they, they give you a lot of reasons to be in the building, studying, working out, they have nutritionists, they have tutors there. So, I mean, they do a really good job of making sure you have the resources to help you out, but you really got to dedicate yourself to it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris, you got a question? Yeah. I've been so hogging it up here. That That's okay, Eric. Uh, so, Steve, uh, going back to 2000, you were elected as uh, a captain that season mm-hmm. as a junior. Uh, something that might happen a little more now, but at the time was almost unheard of. I think you were the first one in almost, what, 16 years? I think before you, Pepper Johnson was the yeah. last junior. Um, I mean, tell me a little bit about, about that and, and kind of what you felt being uh, you know elected by your teammates to, to have that role as a junior yeah i mean obviously extremely honored right and humbled to be able to to be voted that by your peers right and uh i think that goes into you know the work that we put into the off season you know making sure that you're 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 present you're practicing um and that was the same for you know the other guys that i voted for you know that i wanted to be a captain you want to know the guys that were there that you can count on and to me like i said that's probably the biz- biggest honor is just being voted on that and, you know people recognizing that as a junior so i mean i was very humbled and, you know, proud, proud of that happening. Uh, what, what was your big, maybe your favorite moment as Buckeye quarterback? Oh, man, that's a tough one. Um, you know, the, the first night game, you know, against UCLA for me was really special. You know, obviously I didn't start that game, but coming out and playing, uh, you know, you're playing a big time an opponent. Uh, they obviously got up early on a big play. And, you know, that was just, it was a really memorable moment. Of going out there, you know, and just competing and having a having a great night under the lights. Yeah. All right. So you were a Cooper guy, and mm-hmm. um, what kind of good story can you give me of John Cooper? I I, I always like we 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 asked one a week ago. I never knew that Jim Trussell came out in dreadlocks one time. I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one. That one all of a sudden become pretty famous on this show. But what kind of story can you give me about John Cooper? What's a good one? Yeah, you know, Coach Cooper was, uh, you know, he was a good old boy. He always had great one-liners, um, probably some that aren't appropriate to be repeated out loud here. But, you know, the thing that I remember the most about him more than anything is, you know, Fridays was, you know, our walkthrough day, um, typically a lighter day in classes and things like that. And, you know, every Friday he'd come into the facility and find a different player or two and take them over to the, the hospital. And he'd go walk the floors unannounced and go visit with people. Um, not a lot of people knew that about Coach Cooper. I mean, he did that every Friday. And just that was something that I thought was pretty special. And you, know, you talk about things that people don't get to see or, or know about. And that was something that he did. And he really enjoyed going to visit people and just, you know, paying back any way he could. So that's one that really stuck out for me more than anything else. That's great. Now, a lot of people might not remember, well, I'm sure they do, but you were a lefty. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. we just recruited and got a commitment from Air Nolan, uh, who is a, a tremendous quarterback from the state of Georgia. His highlight film is just mind blowing. Uh, I don't know how this guy's not ranked higher than what he is, and he's ranked pretty high, but he's a lefty. Um, I was a catcher in baseball, and left handers, <laughs> pitchers were always a little bit, uh, never really knew where the ball was going to go. Um, What's the difference between when it when it comes to quarterback play being a left-hander that maybe your your common or normal watcher of the sport might not realize, or is there a difference? Yeah, there's definitely some nuances that people have to be aware of. You know, for one, the spin of the ball, right? So if you think of deeper throws and tacking down the field naturally as a lefty, my ball's going to tail off to the left just due to the rotation of it. So as you think of play calling and setting things up and what hash and boundary you're on, there's definitely something that goes into it. But I will say this, I think with today's offenses and how they spread things out, that's starting to become a little bit neutralized, right? I mean, there's so many formations and different ways to attack defenses now based off of the spread. Um, I don't think it necessarily matters too much if you're a lefty or righty. But up front on the offensive line as well, right? You want to make sure the backside is protected. And that's you know normally one of your best players. So that's why you saw in the draft over this past weekend, 
you know, left tackles are a big commodity, right? Because the majority of quarterbacks are right-handed. So there's some little nuances there, but I think the way, you know, we currently do things, I think he's going to step in and be just fine. Good. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the quarterback position itself at Ohio state has completely changed. I mean, it's just, it, you know, we had this stigma for all these years that we didn't have, we didn't produce a, a, a NFL, um, I guess all pro quarterback. And now all of a sudden we've had, three get drafted in the first round. Um, you know, you have two currently now there in Justin Fields and now CJ Stroud. Um, but I still feel, and I make this argument all the time with my TTUN friend who loves to <laughs> rub that in my face, that when it boils down to it, our quarterbacks in the last 25 years have won more than yours in when it mattered in the game. But as far as the quarterback position, when you played versus now, and then in Ryan Day's offense, would you, would you, how would you fare in that offense? Would it be something tailor made for you? Do you feel like, or would you have been more of an urban guy? You know, good question. I, I think, you know, the, the evolution of the offenses over the time have, have really benefited a guy like myself, right? Just that was a little bit more athletic able to do some things on the run and then having some designed, you know, run pass options. Um, so I definitely think it would have been fun to play in. Um, I also think back to my career, I, I thought we did pretty well. Um, obviously, I'd like to see us win, win some more football games and compete. You know, it's funny, I leave and uh, they go on to win a national title. And I don't think they've lost more than two games, but one season, right, in the last, what, 22 years. So it's been a pretty impressive run. And it's been that evolution, of kind of the offense of some of the guys have been picking up. So. Um, yeah, I would have loved to, to play in some of these different style offices, offenses. And I mean, look at the receiver room, you know, the last call it 10 years, put out some really talented guys. So it's, it's been fun to watch. Yeah, it, it's that room is absolutely sick. I mean, it's unreal. Uh, I mean, the even the even uh, gosh, this weekend at the draft, they were calling us wide receiver you. Um, sure. All right. So let's, uh, Chris, you get a question ready. I'm going to uh, pose this one from Larry Daniels here for us. He asks another good question here. He says, any favorite player that you hung around with, are you still in touch with some of your teammates? Yeah, no, still, still talk to quite a few. Uh, obviously still talk to Craig Krenzel. You know, our kids play in some of the same sports leagues, so get to see him pretty regularly. Um, still in contact with Drew Carter. Him and I were roommates. Um, you know, still talk to him pretty regularly. Angela Chatham's. Uh, Joe Cooper, quite quite a few guys. So uh, it's it's a brotherhood, right? And it's fun to see those guys uh, work a lot with Tony Locke and Andy Groom. Um, been a medical device with those guys as well. So yeah, there's quite a few of them that I still talk to and get to see you know on a regular basis. That's that's great, man. All right, Chris, what you got, butter? Well, I'll tell you, I'm I'm sitting here and I'm just kind of reviewing some of some of your games, um, Steve and. Statistically, I mean, at, at the time you had some tremendous statistics. Actually, I, I mean, I'm looking back at your, your specifically your Iowa game where you had 315 and three touchdowns. But I mean, as you look at the way the game has changed, um, and Eric mentioned a little bit of how you would fare in the offense now. But I mean, just how do you think the X's and O's of the game have changed uh, over the last, say, 10, 20 years? Yeah, I mean, you look at what New England Patriots specifically have done over the last however many years when they went on those Super Bowls, they became masters at setting up matchups, right? And in the NFL, that's really hard to achieve. And then as you look to college and, you know, the advent of the spread offense and how everyone is lining up and creating these mismatches, right? And this is where Ohio State has been so highly effective. If you got to pick your poison, right? Who are you going to guard? you got to have people that can move, guard in space, um, so it's really put a lot of pressure because from top to bottom, if you do have a weak spot, these offenses are set up to exploit it, right? A lot of these passing games are much like running, right? They're quick touches, get the ball out into the, you know, your playmaker's hands. So I think that evolution has really challenged defense to put more playmakers at every position. And if you think back to, you know, when I was playing, you weren't in the spread that often. Uh, Purdue probably did it the most and look at how successful they were, right? They were great at finding those matchups. And I mean, I remember one game against Purdue, I think their tight end had like, close to 15 catches because they had something they was working and they could exploit it based off the of formation, right? They knew 
what they were going to get. That's what you've seen today in, in most of these offenses. And the people that can put people in the right position and win those one-on-one -on -one battles do really well. The hardest hit you ever took was from who? <laughs> Ah, uh, geez. Well, there's a couple. Um, the one against Penn State in 99, LeVar Arrington on the sideline, definitely clotheslined me, which in today's football, I think they probably would have tried to eject him. Um, but actually, the worst one was against Purdue. I ended up changing the position or changing the protection, and I forgot to grab my back and pull him over. So the defensive end had a free run, knocked one of my contacts out, and I bit through my tongue. Um, <laughs> Yeah, by today's standards, they probably would have taken my helmet and not let me go back in the game. But I uh, ended up finishing that game, and I think we did pretty well. So, On that note, Steve Belisari, the rules have changed for quarterbacks. Are you for it, or you think they're a bunch of pansies? Uh, I think it's gone too far, right? The pendulum has swung to a, a point where the rules are very inconsistent. I think it's probably the biggest problem. Um, because you'll see some guys, you know, get hit square in the chest and not, not have anything called. And you get other guys that get looked at the wrong way and they're throwing a flag. So I'd like to see a little bit more consistency out of the rest first, because there is, there is none right now when it comes to that top to bottom, but, uh, it's definitely changed quite a bit. Yeah. I, I imagine, you know, I've always wanted to ask a quarterback this question. Like when you watch this game, are you like, are you kidding me? When I played, I, you know, he'd they go in the spiel. So I imagine when you watch a game, sometimes you just shake your head. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's why I laugh. I always tell everyone there, like, what was it like to play quarterback at Ohio State? I'm like, just Google LeVar Arrington highlights and you'll see a couple of the plays of what it was like. Just run around trying to make sure I didn't get killed out there. So. <laughs> All right. Hey, so what are you doing today, Steve? Yeah, so I'm in a medical device sales. So I work for a company called Intuitive Surgical. Um, you know, I sold the Da Vinci robot for a little bit, but now most recently I'm uh, working with a product called Ion that does navigational bronchoscopy to help detect lung cancer. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. How long? It's a really, been? it's an unbelievably cool device. And uh, what's pretty unique about the company I'm at now is. I think they make unbelievable products, but we work with some of the best physicians and surgeons in the world. And what they're able to do with this technology is it's pretty impressive. It's very fun. It's a very rewarding job and makes it easy to get out of bed every day. That's great, man. That's so cool, dude. Um, we have another question from a Facebook user who said, Steve, what advice would you give a young high school athlete who is looking to further his or her athletic career in college? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot that goes into that, but I think in today's environment with social media is being able to have the ability to not listen to the noise. Um, there's always going to be someone that has an opinion or a comment nowadays, which was different. You know, when I was going through this, um, I didn't have Twitter. I didn't have different accounts. I just had fans, right, or people that would potentially maybe know me or you know recognize me. Uh, now that has completely changed, right? And everyone has an opinion. Everyone can go out and make a comment. And if you're good enough to play at that next level, you got to believe in that and turn off the noise. Um, there's probably a hundred other things that I could say, but right now with today's environment, listen to the right people and don't worry about the rest of the comments, right? Go out and just play hard, control what you can control. Yeah, I mean, look at us, Chris and I, years ago, we would have had to, you know, gone to radio school or whatever. And right. Like we've had our different paths and, you know, to get to where we are and, and hosting this show. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're just, we're just two fans with a microphone, you know, and, and here we are talking to a former Buckeye. So that's pretty cool. So, but I agree, you know, the, the, the thing it, it's so disheartening to me as a fan to watch the overreaction that takes place after a loss from sure. the fan base. I mean, yeah, there are things that I'm sure all of us would look back and be like, hindsight's 2020. I wish they would have, you know, ran a different play here, or, you know, player wouldn't have slipped and fallen here, or they would have thrown the flag on this play. But my gosh, some of the people, and I just call them drunk fans, you know, the two percenters who just absolutely, the, the, what they say on social media, they would never say in public to someone. Sure. You know, they're just keyboard warriors. But, that that part that aspect of of this isn't changing anytime soon and so no. you know you you bring up a very good point steve with that but on that note as a as a former player 
And then as a fan, I assume you're still watching the games and enjoying Ohio State football. What's it like as a former player to now have to like be like, like us, we're fans. Like it's, you know, d- is there a part of you who's still like, man, I have the itch, you know? No, I, I, I really enjoy being a fan. Um, okay. And I, I love the style of football that we're playing. You know, I, I made the comment earlier, but you know, I left and they got infinitely better, right? I mean, think about it. We've not had many law, many lost seasons and the amount of talent and players that have come here, I'm, I'm proud of it. And it's fun to watch. Um, you know, I had my moment, so I don't have that itch. If there's anything, I, I, I miss the, I miss the two-a-days, right? I miss the, the crummy parts of, of the football, right? And that's, that's the stuff that I probably miss the most. But I just enjoy going to games being a fan now. I think it's great. Yeah. When you go to fans, do you, how many autographs do you sign? <laughs> oh, it, it's pretty rare. Every once in a while, uh, I get some, but you know, it's crazy to think, but it's been over 20 years since uh, my last game at Ohio State. So really? I, think, I think people uh, are, are yeah. moved on, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> hey, Eric, I would just like to note that I am someone who does happen to have a Steve Belisari autograph. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yes. Nice. <laughs> All right. So who was your mentor while you were there at Ohio State? Geez, uh, there's a lot. I mean, you know, coming in as a freshman, I, Joe Germain was great to me and helped me a ton. Um, but I had a huge advantage in a brother who was five years older, right, who played um, played at a high level, was in the NFL, um, then came back and was a graduate assistant. So, you know, my brother's always been one of my bigger mentors, um, you know, someone that's always been there to help me. So was my dad. Um, but yeah, I mean, th- those are probably the two that stick out the most that have helped me out along the way. And, you know, I've had a ton of great coaches, um, you know, Coach Daniels, uh, who, you know, unfortunately passed away not too long ago, was just an unbelievable mentor and coach as well when I was there. So I've been very fortunate to have a lot of really good people around. Yeah. So uh, we're going to wrap this up here in just a few more minutes. Chris, do you have any last questions before I get to my famous last question? Yeah, just really quick. Uh, Steve, did, did you happen to catch the the NFL draft this past week? I did. I did. So what was kind of your thoughts as you saw some of these guys, you know, sliding down the board, board a little bit who I really feel like we should have had some guys a little bit higher up there, uh, specifically, you know, our our tackle and uh, Dewan Jones and uh, our center Luke, Luke Whippler. Um, and Ronnie Hickman, who a few years ago was just a tackling machine, who's only, uh, I think, was penalized because we had two linebackers step up and play tremendous last year. Sure. Uh, so what did you think about the way the draft kind of played out for the Buckeyes? Uh, I would say this. Overall, the draft has become something very different than, than it's been in probably the last 15 to 20 years. The amount of people that get drafted off of combine stuff is it's kind of weird to me. Um, cause game film trumps all right. And that's kind of to your point, right? I think we have some guys that might've slept a little bit because they didn't have great pro days or things like that, but then you go put on the film and at the end of the day, when you look at the draft, you know, the first two to three rounds are basically who's going to get paid and how they're going to get paid. And that's the whole point of the combat, right? They're going to minutely pick all these different things. And then after that, you are drafting for fit and talent. Um, and I look at Hickman as a great example. I think he probably, if I'm a coach and I don't, am I going to take a pick on a safety that I know I could probably get, you know, as an undrafted free agent. So it's changed the dynamic quite a bit. Um, so I think it played out kind of how I expected in some respects, unfortunately, because a lot of it's heavily weighted on pro days and combines when I, I think it should be the other way around, but, um, I'm the one guy I'm on a podcast with you right now. I'm not playing in the NFL or coaching. So what do I know? <laughs> but but you were drafted to the NFL. So. I was. I was at a position I didn't even play. Right? right. So, I mean, again, that goes back to pro days and combines. And, you know, they took a shot on a guy because I had some good pro day stats and moved me to safety. Right. And, you know, it didn't really pan out. But, uh, you know, that's just the way I think the NFL is on their scouting. And, you know, that's the crazy part about, you know, I look at the last week and a half for CJ Stroud. That was all posturing to try to reduce yeah. the amount of money he could make in a contract, right? Uh, whether any of it's true or not is irrelevant at this point, but it's pretty interesting to watch how that has become it's kind of a game more than anything else. Yeah, it's crazy. It really is. 
Well, listen, Steve, we, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule and joining us this Sunday evening. And, and I really want you to know that I appreciate that. But I always end with this question when I have the opportunity to talk to somebody, and that is this. What does it mean to you, Steve Belisari, to be a Buckeye? Yeah, that's, uh, it's a, that's a deep question for me because of the family ties, right? It is it's like one word that really, I mean, family, right? And more than anything else, I look at my dad who played for Woody, my brother, I have sisters that have gone there. Um, and then the, the friendships and, the, you know, the brothers that I played with, it is family, right? And I look at some of my fondest memories as a fan are watching my brother play, right? Um, you asked the question earlier, what was my favorite memory as a Buckeye? And I had to pick one of me playing, but it was going to the Rose Bowl in 96 and watching my brother and that team win. Oh, yes. Right? So it's just, yeah. yeah, family is the one word I could use to describe it, right? It's hard to it's hard to actually put it in the words or verbalize it, but it means a lot to be a Buckeye for me. Yeah. Yeah, you bring up one of my favorite games all time. My cousin's Ryan Miller, and uh, I, was, I was a youngster then, and uh, – that was the night that I, I got baptized in the scarlet and gray. I fell in love that night. I absolutely yeah. fell. And I've it's no go. It's it it's been every game. You know, I still get teary eyed when you walk into the stadium. You walk, you know, and you just all the ghosts of all the Buckeyes past. Man, it's just to be a feel a part of that. Man, it, you, I think you summed it up well. It's family. It sure. really is. And I think that's why we all hurt so bad when we when we lose that last game in November because it's like our whole like a family reunion that hurts you know so, yeah, no doubt. so but hey listen i really appreciate you coming on with us steve man i i i, I want you to know that and uh, you got a you got a big fan in chris and i and, and all of us here at the ohio podcast but it's that time i gotta go put kids in bed and, and i gotta get ready for work myself tomorrow so remember everybody be kind to one another i owe someone's oh and sing carmen ohio with all your heart until next time oh i owe i owe Go Bucks. <laughs>